Morning. Um, so on a, a certain level today, I'm not going to tell you guys anything you don't already know. I heard a lot of um, what you said yesterday in the in this in the sharing part. It was like, yep, yep, yep. So. A lot of what I'm going to say is probably just going to be validation for what you're already doing. Um, but hopefully it will also give you a few new ideas and it will, by saying there's science and, and data behind what you are, are intuitively doing, um, will make you feel like you're on the right track to begin with. So what I'm going to do is talk about um, what shapes public acceptance. And I'm, it's going to be a bit broader than just smoke because what shapes broader public acceptance of fire management practice is pretty consistent across practices. Um, but I will give some specifics to public prescribed fire and smoke. And then I'm going to talk about social marketing. And this picture I'll talk about later, but this is basically a really successful communication program. Um, what I am pulling from is not just one study, it's not just studies that I'm involved in, it's multiple studies from multiple scientists across the country. A lot of this data, um, if you are really excited about getting more detail. You can get more detail from both of these GTRs. If you are ever looking for um, like scientific information on something about fire, whether it's social or some ecological point, Tree Search is really a great resource. It actually functions very well and it, it provides all Forest Service scientific publications are available at Tree Search and you can search under terms or authors and they will all pop up and you can download them all for free. So it's a really great resource in terms of getting information if you're looking for more detail. So as you can see, there's over 60 study, different studies and over 200 papers that are all about different parts of social acceptance um, in some way. And that's what I'm pulling from. So this is not just one location or one study. Um, nor is it just in the Western US. The studies occur across the country. This is just studies I was involved in up to 2006. So this doesn't count study sites for other scientists. They are weighted toward the West, but they also are some in the Southeast and even the Northeast and the Midwest. And the finding that's kind of consistent across them is that the patterns are consistent across the country at a general level. Local context will always matter, but there isn't a distinction of people in the Southeast respond really completely differently than the people in the West. The basic response patterns are the same. And the kind of key story about the public is we have all these stories in the fire world about the public and what they think and who's the problem and why they think it. And basically, the science shows that none of them are accurate. Um, none of the conventional wisdoms hold up when you look across multiple studies. There's only one so far that I think is, is fairly accurate. So I'm going to go over quickly a couple of these con conventional wisdoms because they're useful in thinking about the public and how we talk to them and how they're responding and why they may be reacting to the prescribed fire or the, the smoke that you're seeing. Um, the one that's common is people don't understand the fire risk if they understood how bad it was and they would know why we're doing prescribed burn and they would support it. Um, so they must not understand the risk. They don't support us. They must not understand the risk. That's the problem. And they do. They get that there's a fire risk. The thing is that risk is a really complicated and very subjective concept. How you calculate the risk is going to depend on a bunch of different factors. And so the basic definition of risk is probability times consequences. In the fire world, often when we talk about risk, it's pure probability. So right there, that's showing you one place where people might be talking about risk in a different way. If one person's talking probability and another's talking probability in a specific consequence, they're talking about a different type of risk. And then it's going to be variable based on what's the spatial extent I'm thinking? Am I talking about the fire risk for the state? Am I talking about the fire risk to the town? Am I talking about the fire risk to the community? Am I talking about the consequence of a house burning down or a habitat being damaged or a habitat being um, improved? And that's actually not a risk because risk is always negative. But um, so how, what you're thinking about shapes your risk. And so you may all be talking about a different risk even though you're thinking talk about the same thing. And so in the fire community, we think about fire risk and we're thinking about risk this summer that there's going to be a fire and it's going to have some damage. Well, that's, you know, 100%. The homeowner's thinking about risk that my house is going to get burnt down by fire this summer. And that, quite frankly, if you look at the number of houses in the wildland urban interface and the number of houses we lose, is not terribly high. So they might be talking about a very different risk. The other thing is how we respond to risk and how we think about risk is very personal. It's going to depend on different things like risk tolerance, risk aversion, the type of um, condition I'm in and what my resources are and how I respond to it. So in one 
case, we did focus groups in five different locations, um, Flagstaff, Arizona, Boulder, Colorado, Reno, Nevada, San Bernardino, and uh, Hamilton, Montana. And we asked people, what's the fire risk for the area? And the really interesting part, one of the really interesting findings was, in each location we had a focus group of people who lived in town, people who lived on the edge of town in the intermix, and people who lived out in the interface. And people who lived in town had a higher risk rating for the fire risk than people who lived out in the woods, which was kind of like, that's weird. Well, when you looked at what they were saying, what was going on was two dynamics. One is they were balancing the benefits. And this is a very common thing found in a lot of risk studies, that the higher the perceived benefits to your risk ex exposure, the lower the risk you're going to see. It's just cognitive consistency. I want to live out here. It's gorgeous. It's peaceful. You make the risk a level that you're comfortable with. And that gets to kind of the other factor that's going on, which to me was the really interesting one, which is self-selection. People who can't tolerate the risk, who are not comfortable with it, are just not going to be living there. So like this woman said, you're right. You live up in the canopy. That's one reason we didn't buy up there. It was too terrifying. So you're also getting self-selection. People who just can't handle it will not be there. So raising the risk perception is not really going to change anything because people already recognize the risk. And if they're there, they're comfortable with it. So what does risk mean? It's basically a necessary but not sufficient condition. You do have to see the risk to think something needs to be done. But that in and of itself isn't going to make you say, I'm going to do something or I'm going to support prescribed fire. Things that come into it are things like risk tolerance, risk avoidance, um, trade-offs with the benefits. Yes, it's, there's a risk here, but it's beautiful, it's private. I'm willing to put up with that added risk because of this. Just like every day, we put up with the risk of getting in a car accident because it's incredibly convenient to get from point A to point B. And then individual capacity. Do I have the time? Do I have the money? Do I have the physical ability to do something? Or with prescribed fire, as we'll be talking about, can, health-wise, can I tolerate this? Or do I have the ability to do something to tolerate it if I can't? So this is the one I heard yesterday that I was like, oh no, please don't go there. Um, we blame Smokey for a lot, and it's really not fair. All Smokey has done is tell people, you should not start a fire. He's not said fire's bad. He's just said, you should not start fires. And I've asked homeowners, what has he taught you? And he, they basically say that I should be responsible when I go out into the woods. So, and... In terms of like the evidence, the evidence shows that the public understands that there's multiple types of fire and that not all fire is bad. Um, it shows that they actually have a pretty good and actually in a lot of cases very sophisticated understanding of fire ecology and in some cases fire behavior. So they understand the beneficial role of fire. They really do get that. Um, so they don't think all fires are bad. They understand some of them are necessary. And the other demonstration of the fact that fire is um, not seen as all bad is when we look at surveys of do you think prescribed burning or thinning is acceptable, it is incredibly consistent across the country and across studies that 80% of the public says, yes, prescribed fire is a useful management tool. When they break it down into like levels of acceptance, in general it works out to, for prescribed fire, roughly 30% say, yes, it's a great tool, you should be using it, go for it. And 50% who say, eh, it kind of depends. Where are you doing it? Who's doing it? Why are you doing it? But they don't automatically rule it out as a, yeah, no, you should not be doing it. And with thinning, it's roughly 40% have that absolute approval and 40% are that kind of more contextual approval. The really kind of the maybe more important factor is there's a clear preference for active management. People want our forests actively managed. So when you have a study that asks questions about preferences and it includes thinning and prescribed fire and thinning and prescribed fire at the same, you know, in conjunction and no action. No action is routinely the least preferred alternative. And we've asked people, you know, how are we doing with fire management? And oftentimes we're not doing very well for fire management in their mind. But the reason why is because we're not actively managing the forest before the fire happens. So they're, they're pretty good with how we manage fires when there is a fire, but we're not actively managing it enough to mitigate the circumstances before the fire happens. There's another one, people don't take responsibility for the fact they've chosen to live out in the woods. And again, that does, just doesn't hold up when you look at surveys and when you do interviews and do focus groups. People understand that they've chosen to live out in the woods and that this is a risk and there's conditions they have to put up with. Um, and they have a strong sense of shared responsibility. And I think this is where some of the, con the contention comes in. Um, 
it does get a little bit more complicated with smoke and prescribed fire. But in terms of defensible space, they definitely are saying, no, I chose to live here. It's my responsibility to mitigate the risk on my property. They also recognize that fire doesn't start, stop as soon as it hits a property line. So they have concerns about a, land management on adjacent property, whether it's private property or more often than not, when they're complaining about management on adjacent property, they're talking about federal lands. It's sort of the attitude of, if you're gonna come and tell me I need to manage my lands, you better be managing your lands. But as you can see by the quote, it's not their responsibility, in this case he was talking about BLM, to make sure we are safe from fire. But once they cut things down, they need to follow through on that work. But we chose to be here, so we need to protect ourselves. So what do they expect of government agencies? Again, multiple studies. The main expectation they have government agencies, as I said, that they manage their land. That's the main thing they want. They also do kind of expect some level of education, or information is probably a better word to put, put in, but it's not basic information. It's not that there is a fire risk. It's not that there are things they can do. It's very specific. Okay, so what is my specific fire risk on my property? Where is the fire likely to come from? How is it gonna behave? For my property, um, does that mean I should um, thin more on this side of my landscape because that's more, where the fire is more likely to be coming from? Which trees do I specifically need to be removing on my property and which can I keep? So they're looking for very specific information, not this very general information because they've gotten that. And one other thing is, is in a lot of cases, if they can, probably the single thing that we could do to help communities mitigate their risk is provide them with help getting rid of the vegetation. That's usually the biggest barrier to people. There isn't an expectation that the government's gonna help them with disposal, but it's really appreciated when, they, when that resource is provided. And it can make a big difference in whether or not people do something. So there's a lot of demographic conventional wisdom about different groups of people that are the problem. The most common one is it's the new people. It's all these new people who are moving here and they don't, like, they don't get fire, they don't know fire, they don't know how we should manage it, and they don't like smoke. Um, for all of the efforts, there's no consistent evidence that the new people are more or less likely to think fire is good or bad or react differently to fire. Um, and, and same thing with smoke. I've talked to a number of people even in the southeast where they're like, you know, the people who've lived here, southeast a little bit less because they have had fire all the time, but certainly in the west, people who've lived there a long time, have been there 30 years, there didn't used to be smoke 30 years ago. And so oftentimes they're the ones who say, we didn't used to have smoke, I don't like smoke now. And the new people kind of move in and they're like, oh, there's smoke here. So it's not a given that those, it's always the new people who are gonna be complaining about smoke or other practices. Why is that? Well, there's two dynamics going on. One is 60% of moves within the United States are within the county. So those new people are new to the neighborhood, they're not necessarily new to the area and they certainly wouldn't be new to smoke. 20% of moves are within state, so again, depending on the state, not inherently new to that area or new to that smoke exposure. Only 20% of the moves are from out of state. And for better or worse in the West, a lot of those 20% are coming from California, often Southern California, where they actually have, sometimes have more exposure to fire. Um, but they definitely have more exposure to things like defensible space and that sort of thing. And they often are the ones who come into a community and look around them and say, this isn't good. And they're often the ones who get their communities to be proactive. The other thing that's going on is a thing called confirmation bias. And this is something that all humans do. It's once we've formed an opinion about something, we tend to give information that reinforces that opinion or supports that opinion more credibility. And any information that contradicts it, we tend to discount. Um, so if I'm saying something that you're like, no, that's absolutely wrong, that's not my experience, you might want to think about whether or not that's confirmation bias is going on there. Um, and so what that says is that people have lived in a place for a long time. They've been exposed to fire, they've been exposed to the, how the world works around them, and they formed an opinion about what the issues are. So when we come and say, the fire is changing, it's worse, they're like, nah, I've been here 20 years, it's never been an issue. And so they're gonna have an opinion and they're not likely to pay attention or give much credence to information that's new and says things are different. People who are new to an area know they're new, know they don't understand exactly how things work and actually tend to be more receptive to information. So I did some interviews in Wisconsin after a fire and one homeowner I talked to, he um, wasn't ter the fire didn't affect his property. There, they did lose houses in this fire. And um, he'd been there 20 years. And I said, did you do stuff for fire? And he goes, oh no, you know, fire's not an issue here. I didn't even think about it. He got through because he sort of had defensible space because he was concerned about wind blowdown. There was another homeowner who 
had defensible space, had done everything on his property. He'd moved in like six months before and he'd gotten a Firewise brochure somewhere after a month after he moved in. He had done every single thing in that brochure and his pro the fire just went around his property and all it did was scorch a shed right at the very edge of the property. So it's not a given that the long-term people are gonna be the ones who get it. In fact, I would argue they're probably more likely the problem if there is a group that's gonna be a problem. Part-timers, it's those seasonals who come in on the weekend, they don't do anything, and we can't get them involved, and they're the problem. Um, again, there's no evidence that they're less likely to get the fire risk. And the evidence as to whether or not they do less is kind of not clear. Um, some studies find no difference between seasonal and part-times. There's a couple studies that do find part-time residents are likely to do less, but the evidence is if they're likely to do less, it's basically a time issue. I'm here on the weekends. I'm not going to spend it mucking around the vegetation. I'm here for a month in the summer. I don't want to put up with smoke. You know, this is, my, this is what I do for my summer where I come, and I want to go play and recreate and do fun things, and smoke messes with that. So it's not really an understanding. It's just a seasonal thing. I'm not here for a time thing. I'm not here for a lot of time. And there are ways you can work with that. Experience. We often think, oh, once they experience a big, nasty, scary fire, then they'll get it and they'll support it and they'll do everything. And with fi fire, as, well, as with all natural hazards, there's a lot of evidence showing that experience doesn't have a consistent effect. For some people, it will absolutely be that galvanizing moment where they're like, oh, that's what they were talking about. Oh, yeah, let's do it. And they get on board and they do stuff. Um, but for other people, it will have the exact opposite effect, um, fatalism. What's the point? Those fires are big, mean, and nasty. There's nothing you can do that's going to make a difference. Why bother? Prescribed burning is not going to change it. Why should I put up from smoke from prescribed fire? Because that's not going to make any difference in, in the wildfire. So it's the fatalism. Or in, case, in a lot of cases with fire, we're good. We've had our fire. There's no fuel left. I don't have to worry about it. So experience doesn't inherently have a positive or negative effect. The vast majority of people actually experience doesn't change their behavior much. What experience does, an event, a fire does, is it raises the salience level of fire as an issue that people think about. So it goes from being number 30 or 40 on their list of, eh, yeah, maybe I should think about it and do something about it, to number five or maybe one on their list of things I should think about whether or not I need to do something. But over the course of three to six months or shorter, depending upon the circumstances, what it, it starts bumping down the list as other things come up of, oh, my, my kids are going to go to college. How could I pay for it? You know, I might lose my job. All those, those kinds of things. Or where are we going to go on vacation? Those all bump up to be what people put on their list. So all it does is it raises this opportunity to get pe where people's attention is there. But it's also been shown that that opportunity is going to be most effective if you've already been talking to people before there's an event. So they're not suddenly saying, oh, so see here, it's more of a case of, oh, that's what they were talking about. So it's, much, it's an event you can take of if you're prepared and you've already let, laid the groundwork, it, you can actually get it, you can use it. But if you haven't laid the groundwork, it's probably not gonna, you, you can't make as much of a difference as if you have. And then there's very few clear geographic or demographic patterns. So we often want to say, oh, it's different in the southeast or it's different in the Midwest. I mean, the only real difference is, is there's not a grand difference in the basic behavior patterns for the southeast and certainly the, the northeast and the Midwest. It's a sale, it, probably the biggest difference is salience. They have other hazards that are much more prominent to them um, that they're going to pay more attention to. But often, like this guy in, in Wisconsin, the hazard they're concerned with, you can leverage to get what you want for fire mitigation. So hurricanes, you can get people to clear around their property so that the wind doesn't blow down on their house. Or, yeah. Um, and then demographic. We often want to say, oh, wealthy communities are more proactive, or the educated people are more or less likely to think something. And there's no clear demographic pattern. By and large, most studies don't find any significant relationship between demographic variables and what people think and do. Um, when they do, it's very inconsistent. The only really consistent ones are, um, smoke, are women and risk perception. And I would actually expect that in the case of smoke, you're going to start running into, there is a, a pattern, although nobody's looked at it in terms of age, um, and both old and young would probably have more smoke exposure issues. But local context always matters. So there might be, in your town, one of these variables does explain it. It might be the new people in your town that are the problem. Local context 
does shape variability in the general patterns I'm talking about. Usually it's actually local history, some event that has shaped how people think about things, or it can be the relationship they have with the agencies, what kind of outreach the agencies have been doing. It might be the local ecosystem that shapes it or the building patterns. Local context always matters. But I would encourage you to start with a general idea of the public that there is no group that's the issue and then look at your city and see what is going on with your community. Okay, so I've sort of said there's all these things that we think is the key explanation of how people respond to fire. What does shape public views? It's pretty straightforward. There's two key variables. Do they understand what you're doing and why you're doing it? The more people understand a practice, the higher the acceptance levels and the lower the concern about neg the lower negative concerns impact acceptance. So the more they understand why you're doing a prescribed burn, the lower the concerns about smoke. This is from a study in Massachusetts, and I put this in here just to show that this is a pattern that works across the country. Massachusetts certainly doesn't have fire like we do um, in the West. But even there, knowledge was the most significant predictor about acceptance of prescribed fire. Some knowledge of prescribed fire led to, was less likely to think it was too dangerous to use, to be concerned about its use near homes, and to be concerned about its impacts on wildlife, aesthetics, and smoke. And in my dissertation, I studied homeowners around Incline Village, Nevada, and I pretty much had identical results to this. Ecological benefits are particularly important in acceptance. People care way more about the health of the landscape around them than they do about the fire risk. This is from a Midwest study, but he also did four states in the, in the West and had very similar results. I just don't have the numbers on that. Um, but basically, 40% rated managing a healthy forest as the most important consideration in forest management. Only 12% said fire risk. And this makes a great deal of sense to me because people live out in the woods because they love the woods. It's beautiful. They're out in nature. They want it to be healthy. It's a positive thing to think about. It's something they're exposed to on a daily basis. It's what you would really care about. Whereas fire, well, it may or may not happen in my community while I live here. It's not really something I care to think about. It's not a positive thing. So it makes sense to me that what matters to the vast majority of people much more than fire risk is the forest health. But this just says that that's a point that we can make a lot and emphasize that point when we talk about fire. We don't just talk about how we're reducing the fire risk. We can also talk about what difference this makes in terms of habitat and vegetation, et cetera. And in, and in terms of homeowners, it can actually be very influential because a lot of homeowners have that want the trees around their property or something like that. We want wildlife. And then they find out, they look at their neighbor and wow, there's, their neighbor has defensible space and they have a lot more deer because it's more open and there's better browsing. And so they actually get more wildlife when they, they have good defensible space. So oftentimes these concerns that we think are the reason they don't do it, you can flip it on its head and turn it into a reason why they do do it. With prescribed fire, ecological benefits, yeah, just as important, probably more important. Um, in a couple different studies, one in California and Michigan, belief that prescribed fire improves wildlife conditions was associated with increased acceptance. In Oregon, smoke was seen as acceptable if the burn was improving forest health. And in Washington, as participants in these focus groups learned about the ecological benefits, prescribed fire and smoke became more acceptable. And I think one of my favorite quotes from any study comes out of this one. They actually had one focus group in Spokane where they recruited people who belonged to an anti-smoke group. Um, and in that group, as people started talking and discussing fire and the prescribed fire and the ecological benefits, people started going, oh yeah, that's true, it does have benefits. They were never okay with agricultural burning because that only benefited the farmer but they became okay with prescribed fire burning because that benefits something they cared about, ecological burning. And one of the participants in the group was like, you know, the more I'm learning about prescribed fire and the benefits of it, the more I'm beginning to think smoke is okay, and that's kind of pissing me off. You know, <laughs> you know so they can, they can hold these two things. They can not like smoke. You know, most of the people in this group had kids who had asthma, and that's why they were in an anti-smoke group. So he was still gonna be impacted by that smoke, but because it, benefit something he cared about, he was, gonna, he was gonna be okay with it. So the two other things that do really shape acceptance of prescribed fire, one is concern about escape. So in, a, in one study in Missouri, Michigan, California, and Florida, concern about escape was negatively associated with acceptance in all four states. The higher your concern level, the lower your acceptance rates. And 
one of the things that might be going on, this is from focus groups we actually did this summer in repeating the focus groups we did in 2004, where we asked people, what's the percentage of Forest Service prescribed fires that escape? And as you can see, they think that roughly 20% of our fires escape, which is a pretty good reason why people would say they don't like prescribed fires. And in the 2004 focus groups, we asked, we said, you know, would you be okay with them doing more? And the first answer was generally, no, why? Because they escape. Well, if people think 20% escape, that's a reasonable statement. But what happened in the focus groups is really interesting, was they started talking about, well, but I don't think, there's usually somebody in the group said, I think most of them go fine. I think we just hear about the ones that go wrong. And this goes to a point people said yesterday about talking about the goods and not just the bads. Um, most of them go right. And as a group started talking, they'd be, yeah, you know, now that I actually think about it, I bet most of them go right, we just don't hear about it. And then once they sort of got that realization, they were like, yeah, yeah, I'm good with, they, sh they should be doing more prescribed fire. And they made statements like these where they're saying, just like John said, if 90% of them are successful, we need to know about it, but we just hear about the ones that don't. And so even then, they're still better with a higher than what the escape rate is. Um, they just need to know that most of them go right. And most people get that not, you know, nature happens and things are gonna go wrong. They need to know all the thought that goes into the burn and what's been going to manage it and decrease the risk. And then they're okay with a few escapes because they, you know, they're not thrilled, but they understand that things will, will go wrong every now and then. Smoke, that's the other thing which we were talking about and which everybody immediately yesterday went to what the key issue is. When I first started working in fire, um, a lot of people said smoke's an issue for recreation and visibility and all these other things. And basically it boils down to not really. The only thing smoke is really an issue for is health. And in surveys, it was really consistent if somebody asked a question about, is there a member of your household who's affected by, has a health issue affected by smoke? It was amazingly consistent that the answer would be somewhere between 28 and 38%. And so it was so consistent, I talked to a demographer, and basically once you hash out the statistics of how many people in the US have you know, asthma and chronic pulmonary disease and heart issues that are affected by smoke, a third of households in the United States have someone in them who's gonna be affected by smoke for a health issue. So for these people, it's gonna be incredibly salient. It's gonna be very important. This is their health or their child's health, and they're gonna be care and they're gonna be very loud. But the other two thirds, smoke is by and large a nuisance that this just kind of gets in the way of things. And an example of sort of how this plays out comes from um, a survey we did after people had toured one of the fire and fire surrogate sites in California, which had treatments. We asked them, what's your treatment preference, prescribed fire, thinning, nothing, or both? And then we asked them, so how important was this variable in determining um, your rating? And so this is for, this is, their answers, and the lower the bar, the more important the variable. So not, not too surprising, the two most important factors in determining what they thought was acceptable was forest health and reducing fire risk. Okay, so what's next? Improving wildlife habitat, erosion potential, cost effectiveness, concern about escape. Smoke is the least important thing after recreational opportunities, after scenic quality. The manager I was working with looked at this, this, this graph and was like, your data is just wrong. <laughs> that is not my experience. My exp I don't get yelled at because of scenic quality and, and, and recreational opportunities of the management what I'm doing. I get yelled at because of smoke. Well, this is the average. When you look at the distribution, it was bimodal. 30% said smoke was a very important consideration and two thirds said it was not at all important. And so that's where you're getting the, this dynamic. And so those 30% are the ones that we're hearing from. The other factor that's really key is trust. Do they trust government um, and, in, who's doing these practices or telling me, giving me this information? In that study of Wisconsin or Michigan, Missouri, Florida, and California, all four sites, trust in government was associated with acceptance of prescribed fire thinning and thinning. And so really key, the more they trusted government, the more accept, higher their acceptance rates. And this is from a, um, a survey where we did in Oregon and Utah. And the first point to notice is sort of like this, yet again, you get this 50%, actually in this case, 50% strong support for thinning, 30% moderate, and 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40%, 40
for prescribed fire. So yet again, you see this pattern that I talked about at the beginning. But the key thing here, um, this is trust in agency managers to use practice to reduce. Ah. I turned my, my nose, uh, noise off last night, and then my alarm clock didn't go off this morning, so I turned it back on. <laughs> um, is that trust in an agency personnel to use a practice to reduce fire risk was the only significant predictor of acceptance. So they did a regression analysis, and you know other factors that had sort of been shown to have a relationship. Trust to implement a practice, very specific type of trust, um, was the only predictor. And it was significant with prescribed fire. I think one, one unit of trust had a six unit increase in acceptance of prescribed fire. So trust is a really key factor. And the good news is that government agency actually fairly, have a fairly high credibility and trust levels when it comes to fire management. In general, local fire departments are generally the most trusted in relation to fire. But Federal land management agencies actually usually come out number two in most surveys. And in a survey in Minnesota, or a study in Minnesota, the Forest Service had a really high level of credibility, but it had it because of the work it had done after a big blowdown in 1999. And as this person has said, the Forest Service has done a good job at keeping the public informed and asking for input. I've been a critic of the Forest Service for years, but now I support them. They made a 180 degree turnaround. So that trust was built because they made this big effort to explain what they were doing and why they were doing and to get input. So kind of what this boils down to is that treatments are generally acceptable well, in trust, provided they are done by knowledgeable, preferably locals familiar with the area. And this is part of the trust. They're knowledgeable. We know they're credible. We know they're competent. We know they know what they're doing. And the local part is key because that they have a very strong sense that if you're local, you understand that the weather's going to change every afternoon at 2, or that there's a road over there that can help you out. So they really have this strong sense that the locals are going to be the most knowledgeable people of the area, and that's who they really trust the most. So if a practice is established, e.g., they've had a chance to see what you're doing and get to understand the practice and why you're doing it, and they trust who's doing it, you're probably going to have pretty high acceptance levels. And I like to reframe this to a slightly different language because this is how I hear people talk about it, and I think it's important that we think about it when we talk about how we're going to interact with the public. It really boils down to being about respect. They are very willing to respect your expertise and what you're doing. They always say, you guys are the experts, you're the firefighters, you know what you're doing, you're the fire manager, you've got the training, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job. But they're only willing to give that respect if they feel they're getting respect in return. If they're getting the respect for the fact that they want to be informed, that they have opinion, and that they have concerns about what's being done, and that those concerns are being taken into account. If they feel like that, they're getting that respect, they will give you the, res the, the respect in turn. But if they don't feel like they're re being respected, they're not going to give you any respect in return. So it really is a mutual relationship. And this is from, I threw this in because we've had a lot of talk yesterday about Flagstaff, and I think this kind of makes a very interesting point. This is from the focus groups we did this summer. So we have this basic data, and we still need to look at sort of what people said to try to understand really what these numbers mean. But we asked people, do you believe that prescribed fire is going to lead to more, less, or the same amount of smoke in the future? And we were trying to get a little bit at this at, this issue of, you know, we often argue if you have prescribed fire now, you're going to have less smoke from wildfires down the road. And do people kind of make this idea? And it's really interesting to me, Flagstaff, nope, they think that prescribed fire is going to lead to more smoke down the road. So this kind of might be, Mary? We didn't get that specific. And we, we'd have to look at the comments that they have to know. Um, my guess is it's the frequency. But here, here's the interesting part and kind of what your and what, where that trust comes in. We also asked them, should the U.S. Forest Service be doing more prescribed fires, less prescribed fires, or the same amount of prescribed fires? Flagstaff, almost half say you should be doing more. So just because they are concerned about smoke doesn't inherently mean that they're going to say you shouldn't do prescribed fire. Um, and I would argue that you get this more in Flagstaff because Flagstaff has been doing a lot of work with the community and people understand it. I definitely remember people from the focus group saying, yeah, but I know why they're doing it. Oh, man, it's miserable because I have to get out my inhaler, but, you know, I'll just deal with it because I know they have to do it. They were not at all happy about it, but they got it. 
I mean, and some were quite happy about it, actually. Um, so, you know, it's not a given that just because they think there's going to be more smoke, they're automatically going to say that's a bad thing. And in the places where they sort of, you had these higher numbers of um, less smoke, well, I need to look at the answers before I hypothesize what that's about. But um, I think it's just, yeah, I'm not going to go ahead and guess. So kind of what does this boil down to in terms of, you know, how to think about it? This is kind of the initial model a lot of people have. I don't think they have it now, but I think they probably had it 10 years ago. They just get the fire risk. We're going to get acceptance. Well, that's a very tentative link. What's more important is understanding. Do they understand what you're doing and why you're doing it? Particularly the ecological benefits, but the fire risk reduction matters to a lot of people. And for some people, there's indications that thinking that it's a cost-effective approach over the long term is, is important. Concerns, yeah, they shape the acceptance levels, but the really useful part about concerns is that you can moderate them with information. So as people understand the ecological benefits of prescribed fire, concern about smoke, concern about us goes down. As they increase their trust and understand why you're doing what you're doing and all the work you're going into, thinking about the prescribed fire and managing the smoke and um, limiting your escape, concern about escape goes down. Other concerns like aesthetics and um, wildlife, those also play into it, but the really important thing to know, I sort of mentioned earlier, is those concerns are as often a reason people support a practice as a reason why they don't. So there's often, you know, oh, people don't like how it looks. Well, there's a lot of people who are like, no, after, you know, when it's thin, it's much clearer, defensible space, the houses actually look nicer. You know, a burn, yeah, it doesn't look so great for a month or two, but then it greens up and it's actually really pretty. There's more flowers, yada, yada. Um, and so the same thing, a lot of times what we think is a concern as a negative is actually for a lot of people a positive. And if, it, if they don't think of it as a positive, a little bit of information can turn it into a positive. The other factor is trust. You know, are the people who are doing this, are the people who are giving me information, are they credible, are they competent? And there's one factor that shapes both of those. Anybody want to guess what that is? We talked about it a lot yesterday afternoon. It's um, communication. Communication can shape how people's understanding. It's, it provides them with information. The exchange of information can help them understand what you're doing. And it also builds trust. They find out who you are and all the work you're doing, you're thinking, and that you are very thoughtful. And they're like, oh, OK. That builds trust and that builds acceptance. So I've talked to a number of homeowners who are there, give me some variant of, God, they wanted to do more prescribed fire, and I hated the idea. It scares me. I don't like the escapes. I don't like the smoke. But then I started talking to the local FMO, and you know, he explained what they're doing, and I, he's a good guy, and he knows what he's doing, and I really still am not comfortable with it, but I get it, and I'm OK with it. So I'm just quickly going to touch on a couple things about communication. What's key in communication? So there's actually a huge field called social marketing which looks at how you do communication to change behavior. It's things like, how do you get people to wear seat belts? How do you get people to um, stop smoking? How do you get people to immunize their children, wash their hands? All these kinds of things. There's a lot of work on how you go about doing that. We can learn from that because we're trying to do the same thing of change behavior, change the norm of what is appropriate behavior. So the key thing and a lot of what I'm try I've got at with the first half is you need to understand your audience. So you need to pr understand them so you can avoid those preconceived notions. Because if you're talking about something that they already get, like if they already get the fire risk, they're going to turn you out because they're, they're just going to say, I already know this. I don't need to listen to this. Or if you're, if you're um, saying something that they already, yeah, sorry, I'm going off and I don't have time. <laughs> But then you also need to tailor the information to them. So you need to figure out what they care about. You don't need to get them to do what you need them to do or to accept something because, for the same reasons that you think it's important. You just need to get them to get there. So use all the reasons. If they care about the ecological benefits, that's what you should be talking about. If they care about how it benefits the habitat of a particular bird, great, use that. If it's a case of you know, they're more concerned about blowdown, well, use that. Don't, you know, it doesn't all have to be about fire risk to, to make people do what you need them to do. So figure out what they care about and avoid saying what they know. You need to understand what the audience thinks. And it also helps you identify the resource limitations. So you can identify, well, the key variable that's stopping people here is just 
There are a lot of retirees. They don't have the physical ability. How can we help them do their defensible space? Or how can we help them manage their smoke risk if they have exposure? Can we identify the people with a health issue, target them so we know where they live, and make sure we give them a phone call anytime we're about to do a prescribed fire so they have some warning? We often like to think, ah, if we just educate them, we provide them with information, that's going to do it. They'll, agree, you know, they'll understand what we're thinking, and they'll agree with us. Well, that's not how it works. What does providing information do? It does raise awareness levels. Does raising awareness levels lead to behavior change? No. Sort of like that risk thing. What does lead to behavior change? Well, mass media? Meh. It's very easy. It's a good way to reach people. It's a very good way to raise awareness levels. So if you're trying to just let people know that there's prescribed fire, it's a great thing to do. But it's not really great for changing behavior or attitudes. The only part of mass media that is useful for changing behavior is brochures, and that's simply because it gives people the detailed information that once they decided they want to do something or pay attention, they can then turn to and say, oh, okay, here's my list of to-dos. What does change behavior? I think a lot of you already got this yesterday. It's talking to people. Interactive communication is the key to changing behavior. Why? Oops, I went too fast. Because it allows people to ask questions, um, to clarify concerns. It allows you to identify where you might have misinformation or not understand what's going on or what the real issue is. So it, it really just allows them to understand and comp clarify what's the matter to them. Um, it's particularly helpful with expert information sources. They really do want to get their information from fire people. That's absolutely where they want to get it. And it builds trust because they have that chance for exchange and they have a chance to find out, oh my God, this is what they've done to, you know, this is all the planning they've done. Somebody yesterday mentioned telling them about planning and I was 100%. The more people understand why you're doing and what you're doing and all the work you're doing to go into, you know, the planning and to manage escape and to manage smoke, whether it's on a prescribed fire or on a wildfire, the more they're okay with it. We once asked people, um, would you be okay if they had more wildland fire use? And the instant reaction was no. But once they heard like no, they, they, but the, the second reaction was, how'd that work? And once they learned that you could only do it if you had a plan in place before there ever was a fire, and then it was probably you know, deemed a, a place that could tolerate a fire or needed a fire and only certain conditions and yada yada, then they were all like, no, that's a no brainer. Of course you should be doing more, more wildland fire use. Use all the good reasons. Everybody has different reasons why they care about something. Use them all. Don't focus on what you care about. Find out what they care about. Use them all. Different people care about different things. Use all the outlets. Some people will respond to one type of information exchange. Some people will respond to one type of information source. Use them all. Just make sure that you're, you have a consistent message. And it doesn't need to be pithy. It just needs to be consistent. So this is a successful program. This is in Klein Village, Nevada. All of those are houses with all those dots, all those lights are multi-million dollar houses. Pretty dramatic burn, nobody complained. In this town, there's also, um, they do a lot of burning in town because there's a lot of public land. And um, there was one guy who was at the bottom of a little valley below the public land and all the smoke was going to come down and hang out at his house. Not happy when they started doing prescribed fire, but they worked with them, they explained what they were doing. And the next year or two, um, they couldn't do any burns because the conditions weren't right. And they got a call from him saying, you know, what the hell are you guys doing? I'm not getting enough smoke in my house. <laughs> so, you know, if you do the work right, you can actually get people there. So to end, in the focus groups that we've done, we go around and say one piece of advice to the Forest Service. And in the end, I think of all the information and all the science, this is probably the simplest and most point, clear point. Could you please tell us who you are, what you do, and why you are doing it. And to me, that summarizes basically good communication with the public. Just tell them who you are, what you're doing, and why you're doing it. That's what they want, and that will get you a very long ways. The other things that are, they, they, and these are in kind of order of how frequently they were mentioned. Next two were, thank you so much for the work you do. We really appreciate, we care about these public lands, and we appreciate the fact that you are managing these lands for us. And thank you for asking us what we think. We purposely got people who were not like yellers, middle ground, said, we really care about our land, but we're really busy. We have other things on our plate. We don't have time to come tell you what we think. We really appreciate the fact you came to us and asked us. Please make your decisions based on science, and please take into account 
the views of locals. And they made a point that they weren't just talking about local citizens, but they were trying to make a point to Washington that we want you to take into account the views of the local staff and agency people, because they're the people here who live with us, and they know what's going on, and they understand our situation. That's future Smokey cleaning up the forest. <laughs> I have not yet gotten permission from Washington to change them. You, you, and, and for those of you who want Smokey to have a new message, you actually need an act of Congress to change what he says. So good luck changing his message. And that's where you can, these are some of the documents that a lot of this is pulled from. Thank you.